If you have your Bibles this morning, take them and open them, please, to John chapter 12. John, not John, Matthew chapter 12. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 12. Am I supposed to preach from John 12? Is that a sign? Yeah, did you know? I guess. All right, no, Matthew chapter 12. My bad. Matthew chapter 12. We're going to be looking this morning from verse 22 to 32. I've only been in Matthew for a year. How did I say John? All right, Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 32. And we're going to continue in part two of what we began last week. So last week the sermon was binders, <coughs> gatherers, scatterers, and blasphemers. But we looked at the binding of sin. This morning, part two, we're going to be looking at the unforgivable sin. And so our focus this morning is really verses 30 through 32. But just for the sake of context and to remind us of everything that's happening, we're going to read from verse 22 down. So once you've found it, if you're able, please stand with me for the reverence of the reading of God's word. Matthew chapter 12, beginning with verse number 22. The word of the Lord reads, Then a demon-oppressed man, who was blind and mute, was brought to him, and he healed him, so that the man spoke and saw And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon me. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Either in this age or in the age to come. Let's sense this reading of the holy, inspired, and Aaron, infallible word of the living God. Receive it as such, and let us go to the Lord in prayer again together. Father, as we come before you this morning, we thank you for the truth that we have already sung, for the word that we have already heard read. And Lord, we thank you as we look back to last Sunday, and as we look to this text again, we are reminded that you have sent Jesus to be the all-powerful Savior filled by the Holy Spirit to bind Satan and to plunder his domain through the salvation of sinners. Now, Lord, this morning, as we look again at this text, we're going to focus on this idea of the unforgivable sin. And you know how often many of us have have worried and feared with anxious thoughts that perhaps we have committed this unforgivable sin. So many have come to me, O Lord, and have asked, how do I know what this sin is? How do I know that I haven't committed it? And so, Lord, I pray this morning that you would speak to our hearts and souls and minds assurance. If we are saved, assure us of that salvation, that we would know beyond all shadow of a doubt, not only have you forgiven our sins, but that you will also preserve us and keep us from this, the unforgivable sin. At the same time, if there is one here who is not saved, one listening online, who is, who is worried about this, I pray that you would utilize this to draw them to salvation in Christ, that today would be the day where not only would you forgive them of all of their past sins and past blasphemies, but you would guarantee them of an eternal preservation and security in Christ. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through your word this morning, illuminate this text for us, For indeed, it is one that has tripped up and confused many. Give us understanding that not only would we know it, but that we would learn from it, be encouraged by it, and apply the truths to it, of it, to our lives in a practical way. I pray that you would, hiding behind your cross, make these words yours, not mine. 
and accomplish your sovereign purposes, for it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So last Sunday, when we looked at this text, we saw that the Pharisees were in fact blaspheming Jesus. We saw that Jesus was continuing to contend with the rejection of the Pharisees and their desire, remember, not just to persecute him, not just to kill him, but to utterly destroy him, to ruin his reputation before others so that no one would follow Jesus anymore once they were through with him. And so they begin to blaspheme. They say he's, he's casting out demons, not by the power of God, but by the power of Satan. And so Jesus proved that not only was that utterly impossible, for Jesus was doing what Satan could not do, but he also proves that being filled by the Spirit of God, that the kingdom of God had come, and that he was here to bind Satan up so that he would be forced to watch as his entire kingdom on this earth was conquered, as his, his goods, you and I, those who are formerly enslaved to sin, as his goods were plundered by Christ. And that's what's been happening ever since his first advent, ever since the incarnation. Jesus has bound Satan and has forced him to watch his goods plundered by saving each one of us by drawing us to himself through the gospel at the right time. But as we continue to look at this text, Jesus isn't just going to let this blasphemous accusation slide on by. No, instead he is going to warn the Pharisees about how dangerously close they are to being totally outside the realm of God's grace to being turned over, as it were, to a reprobate mind, a hardened heart, which is incapable of repenting. For it has become so hardened to the grace of God. So he begins in verse 30 by telling us the simple truth. If you're not with them, you're against them. If you're not with them, you're against them. doesn't matter if you're intentionally trying to do harm to his kingdom, or if you're just trying to stand idly by, if you're not with Christ, you're against him. And from there, if you're not with him, you're going to be in danger of this unforgivable sin. So he explains the unforgivable sin in verses 31 and 32. And then at the end of 32, he also warns us that those who commit this sin receive eternal, everlasting punishment and judgment. So we're going to take this step by step. And we're going to begin with this. Number one, we see the gatherers and the scatterers. The gatherers and the scatterers. Now, I'll be honest with you. I typed this in Word multiple times, and I kept putting a red line through the words saying that they're not real words. But then I Googled it, and it said they were real words. So I'm going with it. Gatherers and scatterers. I'm pretty sure they're real words. And what this describes are those people... Those individuals, the gatherers, are those who are with Jesus. Those who have first been gathered into the kingdom of God. Those who have believed the gospel of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and thus have been saved, and now are going out, and they are proclaiming the gospel. We are proclaiming the gospel, and thus gathering more people into Jesus' kingdom. Plundering more of Satan's goods and seeing sinners saved. Not in our own power, but by the power of God. The scatterers are those who are against Jesus. Those who are opposed to his work. And one way or another, not only are they outside of the kingdom of God, but they are preventing others from coming in as well. And that's why in verse number 30, Jesus makes an incredibly simple but important statement when he says, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. This is the easiest verse that we're going to look at this morning. If you're not with Jesus, you're against him. If you're not saved, you're lost. If you're not a child of God, you're a child of Satan. If your sins have not been forgiven, you're underneath the wrath of Almighty God. 
And so this text is very helpful in making certain we understand there is no such thing as neutrality when it comes to Jesus Christ. There's no such thing as standing on the sideline and saying, I'm going to wait and see what happens. You can't pull a, a Switzerland here and say, I'm going to be neutral throughout this war. They're the ones that are neutral, right? Switzerland? Sure, I'm going with it. You can't pull that. You can't say when it comes to this war between God and the forces of evil that I'm going to stand idly by on the sideline and do absolutely nothing at all because in this war, to be idle is to be on Satan's team. To be idle is to be enslaved to sin. There are a lot of people that say, well, when it comes to arguments upon this earth, I'm going to stand by, I'm going to see as, as all of the facts unfold before me, and then I'm going to make an educated decision about which side I'm going to take. And a lot of the time, when it comes to current news and events, that's incredibly wise to do, because often we don't know who to believe, we don't know what side is true, more facts come out, it completely changes what we originally thought was right and good, but that's when it comes to current news and events. You can't pull that with Jesus. You can't say of God that he has not given you enough information to make an educated decision. Because he has given you 66 books of the Bible whereby he has proved beyond all shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the stronger man who binds the devil and plunders his goods. He is the victorious one. And so you can't look at Jesus and say, I'm not sure yet. I don't have enough information. No, you have all the information you need in the Bible. And not only that, God has given you the world around you. He has given proof and evidence of himself all over the place. Because the creator of the universe has stamped his thumbprint on every piece of art he has created whether it be another human being or it be a tree or a flower in a field, God has left indelible marks of his sovereign power everywhere. So we know he exists. He's given us a conscience whereby we know that we're sinners. Even as we try to suppress the truth, we know we're sinners in need of a savior. And so we are left before God without an excuse. There is no neutrality when it comes to God. You can think of it this way. It's as though Jesus is storming the beaches of Normandy and he's going up against Satan's forces. And we're, we were formerly part of Satan's forces. We were formerly part of that army. And if we would have continued to fight against Jesus, you know what would have happened? He would have ran us over. He would have crushed us as he advanced forward. If we would have said, well, I'm not going to fight, but I'm just going to stand nearby, you know what would have happened? We would have been crushed. He would have plowed us over and he, as he advanced across Satan's domain. But for every single one who waves the white flag of surrender and comes out, what we find is Jesus is a kind and benevolent Savior. And though we were once on the enemy's side, Jesus invites us to join his army and to march behind him. And so as he paves the path to victory, we march alongside him, declaring his gospel to everyone we meet along the way. You're either with him or you're against him. But there can't be any of this nonsense of, well, I'm just not going to choose a side. I'm not for him. I'm not against him. I'm just not going to choose. You can't, you can't do that when it comes to Jesus. I love how C.S. Lewis put it and mere Christianity. He said, a lot of people say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Lewis says, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. So you must make your choice. Either this man, Jesus, was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let none of us come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. 
He has not left that open to us. And so taking Lewis's words, let us put it this way, don't patronize him by saying you're going to be neutral. You're going to be idle. Because as the old saying goes, the devil will find work for idle hands to do. Idle people will be used by Satan to scatter rather than gather. It's kind of like the militant atheist. You know, the sort of person who sits behind the keyboard furiously typing about how they do not believe in God. They say God doesn't exist, but they hate him anyway. And they can't stop themselves from talking about how much they hate God, even though they don't believe in God. So it is with the person who wants to remain idle. They will become opposed to the work of Christ, and they will not be able to stop themselves from violently opposing that work as much as they possibly can. This is why in Matthew 13, when Jesus teaches his parable about the sower of the seeds, he says there's, there's seed, there's word, the word of the gospel, that goes into the hearts of some and it takes root and it grows into everlasting life. But there are others who have this seed scattered. And rather than believing, they reject Christ. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew 13, 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one, that's Satan, comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. And this is what was sown along the path. Those who do not gather with Jesus scatter in this way. They become the devil's servants and they actually end up opposing people so that they do not enter the kingdom of God. And those who oppose Jesus, those who scatter rather than gather, they're in danger of the unforgivable sin. And so we see, secondly, the unforgivable sin in verse 31. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, every sin and every blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. This is probably the singular verse that I have had more questions about than any other by various people over the years. I've had many come to me, young and old alike, come to me incredibly worried that maybe they've committed this unforgivable sin. And they're worried about it. They want to know, am I able to be saved? Am I saved? Is there a place for me in God's kingdom? How do I know? How do I know? Well, first, let's take it again, step by step. Here's the good news. Notice what Jesus says. Every sin, every blasphemy will be forgiven by God for those who repent, for those who trust in Jesus. Every sin, every blasphemy. Here's the bad news, except for one. And that is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, admittedly, there's some debate. Can this unforgivable sin, can blasphemy against the Holy Spirit in this way be replicated today. Some scholars, some commentators suggest that it cannot be replicated today. That this was a peculiar sin only possible in Jesus' day because those Pharisees in Jesus' day, they saw the miracles that he was performing, they heard his teachings, they saw it firsthand, and they had every reason to believe that this was the Messiah filled by the Holy Spirit. And rather than give God the glory, they try in their bitter jealousy to accredit and ascribe this work to Satan instead. And so some say you can't repeat this sin today. That this was a peculiar sin only possible for those who were living in the same time in which Jesus walked the earth. That's possible. You could read it that way. However... I don't think that's the case. And the reason I don't think that's the case is because Jesus never actually says the Pharisees have committed the unforgivable sin. In fact, he says blasphemy against himself will be forgiven. And that seems as though that's what the Pharisees have done. They have blasphemed Jesus, but they can still be forgiven. It's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that can't be forgiven. The question is, what is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit then? If the Pharisees didn't do it here, what is it? Well, there are other 
places in the New Testament that make the case that there is a sin so incredibly sinful, so incredibly wicked, that when others commit it, we ought not to pray for them. This is 1 John 5.16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death. But, John says, there is sin that leads to death. And I do not say that one should pray for that. So again, there's a particular sin, so heinous, so wicked, so evil, that when somebody commits it, we're told, in the word of God, not to pray for that person. It's unforgivable. They've been turned over to a reprobate mind. There is nothing left for them. Again, though, the question is, what is the unforgivable sin? How does one blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Well, I think the writer of Hebrews helps us the most with coming to a conclusion of what the unforgivable sin, of what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is. And we're going to look at two locations in particular. First, Hebrews 6, and then Hebrews 12. Hebrews 6, and then Hebrews 12. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, the writer of Hebrews says this, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. Since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and are holding him up to contempt. The language here is incredibly important. It is impossible for those who have been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit to be renewed again to repentance. What does that mean? Well, it does not mean that it's possible to lose salvation. And the language that's used here in this text is incredibly important. This is describing those who have tasted the heavenly gift. But in John 6, Jesus intentionally says, it's not enough just to taste. You must have all of Jesus. He says, you must eat my flesh. You must drink my blood. And he's not just talking about communion or the Lord's Supper in that text. He is referring instead to having full total belief in Jesus. You must be in Christ and Christ must be in you. So what is this describing? Well, this is describing the Pharisees. This is describing Judas. This is describing many churchgoers today who come into the house of God and they experience many of the blessings of God. Oh, they taste and see God is good. And the Christians who are around them are blessed by God and in a sense, they get secondhand benefits from it. They experience some of those blessings for themselves. They taste and see that God is good. They enjoy the fellowship of being with the saints of God, but they themselves are not part of it. And either they deceive themselves into believing they're saved when they're not, or they intentionally, like a chameleon, try to blend in, all the while rejecting the grace that God is offering to them through the gospel. And so over time, in their rejection of the gospel, they are so hardened in their hearts and minds, God turns them over to a reprobate mind, and thus they can't repent. Hebrews 12, 15 to 17 helps to explain it too. It tells us here, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. That root of bitterness is what we see in the Pharisees in this passage. And by, many, and by it, many become defiled. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he had no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. So again, let's think this through. It's not talking about those who lose salvation. That's not possible. That would suggest, for example, that God changes and that you have the power to change God's disposition towards you. And John 1 is very clear that this is not the case at all. For in John 1 we're told that we who are saved, we are saved not by the will of man, not by the will of the flesh, but by the will of God. 
So God saves sinners, and if God saves you, He did not change His mind about who you were. He had planned to save you from eternity past, and He's not going to suddenly change His mind. He's not going to change His disposition towards you because of something you do or don't do. God is far greater than that. And He is going to preserve you from doing what we're reading about in Hebrews 6 and 12. He is going to preserve you. He's going to keep you from the unforgivable sin. That's the good news. The bad news is that there are many who, like the Pharisees, like Judas, they taste and see that God is good, but this root of bitterness comes up within them. And they realize they want the things of this world more than they want God. They love the sin more than they desire Jesus. And in their rejection of him, over time, they are given over to their hardness of heart. God no longer shows them any grace. And because of this, they don't seek God's grace. And because of this, they can't repent. We are created to be in the image of God. We are created to belong to God, to belong to Christ. But those who reject Christ long enough over time are turned over to this reprobate mind. It leads to a hardened heart which will not repent, which is exactly what we see in Romans 1, 28 to 32. This is speaking of those who are well on their way along the path to the unforgivable sin. We read, Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind, or a reprobate mind, to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. So what is the unforgivable sin and blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? It is to reject the grace of God in the gospel. It is to reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and do it enough times and eventually reprobate mine. It's unforgivable. And there is no chance for repentance. The Pharisees are dangerously close to it. They have all the proof and all of the evidence before them, and yet they are refusing to believe. And so Jesus is warning them, you are close to committing this sin. You are close to God turning you over to a reprobate mind. And if that happens, understand, all that's left for you then is eternal judgment. And so we see thirdly, eternal forgiveness or eternal punishment promise. Eternal forgiveness or eternal punishment promised in verse 32. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Now again, great news here. You come to Christ, it doesn't matter what sins you have committed, He will forgive you. It doesn't matter what blasphemies you've made or you've accused Him of. He will forgive you. He is that kind, and He is that gracious, and He is that merciful, and He is that loving. But there is this unforgivable sin, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, where in your rejection of Him, you're turned over to a reprobate mind. And those who are turned over to a reprobate mind are promised, notice, eternal destruction, everlasting destruction, so it's not just you close your eyes in death and everything goes black. Oh no. This is everlasting, eternal destruction in a lake of fire where the suffering does not end. The book of Revelation tells us about this lake of fire. In Revelation 20, verse 10, we read that the devil who had deceived the, the saints, who had deceived the world, he was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forevermore. What is the lake of fire? It is torment, night and day, forever and ever and ever. It is God's wrath poured out for eternity. Now, a lot of people say, well, hell, that's not, for, that's not for the people that God has made. That's only for the devil and his demons. But again, that would suggest change in God. And remember, God doesn't change. So when he prepared the lake of fire, he knew he was preparing it 
not just for the devil and the demons, but for the sinners who would reject him, for those who would commit the unforgivable sin. And so we read in Revelation 20, verses 12 to 15, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before God's throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And listen, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the worst possible thing that can happen to anybody. This is why C.S. Lewis once said, there's no such thing as a mortal. You've never met a mortal person. Every person you come into contact with, they are immortal. They're going to spend eternity either in heaven, either on the new earth, with Jesus in the presence of God forevermore, or in the lake of fire. This is why it's so vital we proclaim the gospel and call sinners to repent. This is why it's so important we become gatherers rather than scatterers. Because we're told in Revelation 21, 6 to 8, Jesus said, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. You don't have to do anything to earn this salvation. He gives it freely. And the one who conquers, the one who comes to Christ, will have this heritage. I will be his God, and he will be my son. But, as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This is a clear warning. Those who commit the unforgivable sin, those who refuse to see the work of Jesus Christ as being the work of God, those who refuse to repent, those who refuse to trust in him, are promised this eternal damnation in the lake of fire forever. But if you're sitting here this morning and you're going, how do I know? How do I know that's not me? How do I know I haven't committed that sin? Let me ask you, are you worried about it this morning? Because if you're worried about it, that is incredibly good indication you have not committed the unforgivable sin. Because the only people who are worried about it are either A, saved already and filled by the Holy Spirit, who is going to preserve you and keep you from committing this transgression, or B, the Holy Spirit's working upon you. And he's drawing you to Christ so that today would be the day of salvation. So if you're saved... Stop fearing. Stop worrying. God will preserve you. God will keep you. But now, go out, because you realize how serious this is. Go out there to a lost and dying world and tell them of the good news of the gospel, because Jesus is the only one that can save them. But if you are sitting here this morning, you're going, I just don't, I don't know. Am I saved? I'm not sure. Have you repented? Have you trusted in Jesus? Have you asked him to forgive you your sins? Because the promise here is very, very simple. Ask him to forgive you. Believe in him by faith. And what will he do? He'll save you. He'll forgive you. And then he will preserve you. And keep you. And will make sure that you do not commit this unforgivable, unpardonable sin of not believing in him. For he will remain faithful even when we ourselves are faithless. But if you're a Christian, stop letting the devil get in your head. Stop getting in your own head. Don't walk in fear and trembling, worrying all the time about this particular sin. Take the warning seriously, yes. But then, encourage, go forth knowing that your God is so sovereign, so supreme, he will keep you from committing this sin. And then go forth with all of the boldness you can muster through the power of the Holy Spirit. Go forth and proclaim the good news of the gospel to every person you come into contact with, every man, woman, and child, for Jesus saves sinners. Stand with me this morning as we pray together. Father, as we come before you again today, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the warnings that are here within it, whereby we are called to repent of our sin and to trust in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. Lord, 
If there's one here, one listening, who, who doesn't know Jesus in this way, help today to be that day of salvation by doing what only you can do and draw them to salvation. But Lord, for those of us who do know you, I know that this can be an agonizing concern for many. Lord, remind us that you are all-powerful, that you are sovereign, that you are good, and that you will not be denied. And so for those whom you have saved, you will keep saved. Remind us of that truth, and then, in your infinite power and wisdom, send us forth to proclaim your gospel far and wide. For your glory and honor's sake, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.